Our scripture today is from Luke chapter 22, verses 14 through 38. I'll ask you to leave your Bible open. We will refer to selective passages as the sermon proceeds. The setting for these verses, Luke 22, verses 14 through 38, is that last gathering of the Lord with his disciples prior to his experience in Gethsemane and at Calvary. Understanding this scripture helps us to realize the significance of communion, which we will partake of as our service closes this morning. What do we expect as we gather around the Lord's table? What is the Lord saying to us in the communion time? As a clue to what he's saying, I simply take the events of Luke 22, where the Lord commemorated this feast to be kept. The first thing that I see that is meant to happen when we gather for communion is the fact that we recognize the intense desire on the Lord's part to be here. When the hour came, he sat at table and the apostles with him, and he said to them, I have earnestly desired, or with desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. According to Luke 22, verses 7 through 13, careful plans were taken by the Lord to protect this moment with his disciples, lest he be betrayed in the midst of the meal. He wants to be with them prior to his death. The strongest indication in my life, which has given me an inkling of the Lord's desire for fellowship, reaches back to... The fall of 1962, when as a young college graduate I was bound from Missouri in my two-tone green 54 Pontiac to Southern California and Pasadena where I was to go to school. I recall arriving late on a Friday afternoon. I began crying as I drove into Pasadena. I couldn't figure out why I was crying until it dawned on me that this was what smog was all about. I drove up to the seminary and I looked around at what would be later my home for four years and didn't, of course, know anyone there and there's not a great deal of attractiveness in buildings when you don't know people and you're alone. And I recalled in my desperation of that Friday afternoon just wanting to find someone I knew and literally almost knowing no one in Southern California with the exception of maybe a couple of people at Southern California College and without knowing anything about a Friday freeway rush, I got on the freeway at 4.30 to come 60 miles to SCC just to see if I could find someone I knew just to get a hold of a familiar face and to hear a familiar voice. And I made it down here and while I was making a call at a phone booth after not having found anyone, someone walked by that I knew and I, my heart skipped, and then I found out that there was a choir that was singing at a church in the area made up of people that I knew, and it was like a tremendous oasis, just that moment of fellowship in a very lonely time. It gave me an, a smidgen, an inkling of what the Lord was feeling at this moment when he is headed toward the cross in the agony of Gethsemane, and he's reaching out to the people that are closest to him, sharing, with desire I have desired, to be with you and take this Passover. Passover would be the Jewish equivalent to the American Christmas. As much as possible, if we still have a recognizable family unit, we try to be with that family unit on a day like Christmas. To take a meal together, people will travel distances, fly across oceans to be together in that moment. And so the Lord, in this great, significant, symbolic occasion of the Passover of Israel, wants to keep that meal with his own. And it is emblematic of the fact that whenever believers gather in his name, there the Lord has with desire desired to be among us. So the first thing we say about this communion is that in a very real way, in a spiritual way, Jesus is here and desires fellowship with us today. The second thing we learn about communion from this passage in Luke 22 is that while we recognize his desire to be here, and indeed he is here in a spiritual sense, this communion teaches us and explains to us his physical absence. 
For it is he who will say, I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom comes. So while he is here, in a spiritual way, we do not see him in body. We simply, as Paul says, as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, proclaim the Lord's death until he come. And this is a great anchor of concrete reality, this bread and cup pointing to a future event where a more lavish table will be spread and a banquet meal will be celebrated. It is thought that the procedure for the Passover meal in the time of Christ may have gone something like this. As the Passover meal commenced, there was an inaugural blessing followed by a prayer. There were four cups of wine to be drunk during the course of the meal. The first cup was lifted after the blessing and prayer, And then a dish of bitter herbs and spices were served, commemorative of the hardships in Egypt. Following that, there was the story of the significance of Passover and its meaning in the original Exodus session. Then a second cup was lifted, a cup of blessing and drunk. After grace, the main meal of the roast lamb was served with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. And after that meal and following prayer, there was the lifting of the third cup of wine. Following the third cup, the Hallel, Psalms 114 through 118 was sung, and then the fourth cup, the last cup, was lifted and drunk. As we lay over the gospel record against this framework of celebrating Passover, we may suppose, as William Lane, professor of New Testament at Gordon-Conwell Seminary, supposes, that the bread was distributed to the disciples before the eating of the lamb. And that when the cup which followed it was lifted up, it was the cup at the close of the time of eating of the lamb, the third cup. The Lord lifted it and said, I will not drink this with you until I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And then, according to Matthew and Mark, they went out and sang a hymn. The Hallel, the hymn, Psalm 114 through 118, would have normally been sung at the close of the meal inside the room, but Jesus changes the feast just enough to close it with the third cup and move out so that as William Lane suggests, and we cannot prove this, but it is a fascinating and intriguing concept, that the last cup of that day was never drunk and it will never be drunk until all of the kingdom of God has been complete. And when we all together, making up the church through 20 centuries, have sat down in the future in the kingdom of God with the apostles and the prophets and the saints of the ages and together will end the meal at the same time. You show forth the Lord's death until he come. So we recognize as we take that this bread and this cup has yet a fuller expression and what we have here is but a symbol of of a meal past and yet a meal to come. Thirdly, this gathering together around communion finds us hearing the Lord requesting us to remember Him. This do in remembrance of me. Jesus had nothing physical to leave His disciples whereby they could remember Him. He had no material goods. Even the limited things which he did have, the clothes on his back, would be given to the soldiers at the cross when they would divide his raiment among them. There was nothing to give that they might remember except Jesus had given them his life, his words, his miracle, and now this, this bread and cup, this do in remembrance of me. So when we take the bread, we remember the body of our Lord. The bread is so expressive It is an impressive type or example of suffering. For grain is buried in the dark earth. It is exposed to many dangers before it comes to full growth. And it is cut down when ripe. It is threshed with heavy blows. It is sifted. It is ground in the mill. The flour is kneaded into dough. It is pressed into the shape of loaves. It is thrust into a hot oven and baked. And finally, it exists after all that process simply to be broken. And such as the bread of life is our Lord, who is pressed into the dark of the earth, 
who is cut down when he is ripe, who is threshed with heavy blows, who is sifted and pressed into the experience of Gethsemane, and who is put into that oven of Calvary, where Psalm 22 would say, My strength is dried up like a potsherd, a piece of clay out of which all moisture has been baked. All of that simply that he might broken, might be broken, and that his life might be distributed to us, and we might eat in that spiritual sense and live. And the cup, expressive of the fact that the blood has been separated from the body, the blood has been shed, real death has eventuated. Remember. And in remembering, as we take this bread and this cup, we remember Christ's love for us, and we're to remember our first love toward him. And as we take, we are to remember also that there is a plenteous supply of life that comes from him. When we finish communion today, we will not go from this place wondering, when the next communion comes, will there be bread enough that we can take again? Or there will, be, will there be fruit of the vine enough that we can take again? For taking this communion... Symbolic of taking the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ can be represented in going down to the ocean and taking a cupful of water from the ocean. One does not diminish the supply of the ocean by taking a cupful. And one does not diminish the supply of grace and mercy and freedom in our Lord Jesus Christ by simply eating once. Remember, remember, because we may forget. Oh, not so much forgetting intellectually, but forgetting in the heart, forgetting the high cost of why we're here and the great love that has brought us to him. Fourthly, Jesus, in this room of communion, warns of betrayal. He says, Behold, the hand of him who betrays is with me on the table. The Son of Man goes as it has been determined, but woe to the man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to question one another, which of them would do this. When we speak of betrayal, we have that same reaction of the disciples when we consider the love of our Lord and when he says, one will betray me. Lord, is it I? Communion is the time where we can look at our motives and ask where we've been. And if things have accumulated in our life which are pulling us away from the Lord, if things are there which a month ago weren't there, if we have become insensitive and dull to him and let sin accumulate like barnacles upon the soul and fiber of our life, one of you betray me? And to look around at the person's in closest fellowship and relationship to us and ask if within that relationship there are seeds of betrayal. This moment brings us face to face with our need for fidelity. For the Lord has been faithful to us. Fifthly, the Lord corrects our relationship to others at the table. <clears throat> he will not allow us to come and be at odds with each other. A dispute arose among them, which of them was to be regarded as the greatest. And the Lord will have nothing to do with that. I love these disciples, by the way. They are so incredibly unhearing about what the Lord is saying that he's giving his life for the world, his blood is going to be shed, he's going to die on the cross, they, like you and I often do, single out the things they want to hear. And the thing they wanted to hear was, I will drink it with you in the kingdom. In the kingdom. If there is to be a kingdom, then we're on the inside because we have been with him in the campaign. And when he wins the election, we will get the chief positions. <clears throat> So they quarrel among themselves. And the Lord will not allow it at his table. He in this moment will say in our relationships to one another, Have you cleared out the enmity, the competition, the pride, the strife? This is a table for healing, for reconciliation, for fellowship. 
Christ has invited us to his table, and we dare not at that table introduce our hostilities, whether they be personal hostilities towards someone near to us, or they be hostilities of race or national pride or jealousy or envy or contempt. This meal in the early church proved the significant difference in the world, for here was a meal where there was neither slave nor free, neither Greek nor barbarian, neither Jew nor Gentile, neither male nor female, where all the distinctions the world raised were leveled, and we share together as the family of the Lord. Here we forget our differences in our common blessedness and glory at being invited to such an occasion. Sixthly, the Lord in the communion imparts assurance concerning the future. He says to us, you are those who have continued with me in trials. As my Father appointed a kingdom for me, so do I appoint for you that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. He lets us know that beyond this event is a greater event to come and that we as his people are unique and distinct from the world because we know there is a future. Like the dying thief on the cross, we have come to faith in Christ to reach out and to say to him, Lord, remember me when you come in your kingdom. Believing when we say that, that he is the Lord and he has a kingdom. There is a future for the people of God. And seventh, Jesus at this communion, as he did at the first communion, individualizes according to our needs. One at the table had special need, Simon. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brethren. From that first communion until now, when the body of believers comes together, there are always those at the communion in need of a special and unique word from the Lord because the pressures and the trials which they are facing, whether they are aware or, like Peter, unaware of them, are very real and pertinent. And the Lord, who knows the future, has the power to speak a word of assurance. Satan's demanded you, but I prayed for you that your faith will not fail and that you will strengthen your brethren. It is a comfort to realize Christ prays for us. We have a high priest in the heavens who ever liveth, ever liveth to make intercession for us. Now the only way I know to understand that and interpret that is that Christ is praying for me in the heavens. And if my prayers on earth have effect with God, how much more the prayers of the Son of God exalted at the right hand of the Father. He has prayed for me that my faith fail not. And even in this communion, God will speak to you in a unique way as you have need. Realize after the communion in the first service to have a person come to me and confirm that God was speaking to them in a very special way as we took communion in the 830 service is but to repeat again what the Lord is doing here, singling us out and individualizing with his love and his particularity and focus upon our needs. And in as a last thing, an eighth thing, which happens in the first communion, the Lord tells us to expect danger and difficulty in the times ahead. He said to them, when I sent you out with no purse or bag or sandals, did you lack anything? They said nothing. He said to them, but now, let him who has a purse take it and likewise a bag and let him who has no sword sell his mantle and buy one. I tell you, this scripture must be fulfilled in me. And he was reckoned with transgressors, for what is written about me has its fulfillment. They said, look, Lord, here are two swords. And he said to them, it is enough. Kind of a difficult scripture to interpret and understand. Becomes simpler if you acknowledge the fact that Jesus often used literal terms to connote spiritual meanings. For example, he says to the disciples on one occasion, beware of the leaven of the scribes and Pharisees, or the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the disciples mistook him, thought he was talking about real material leaven, and get all wrought up as to what this leaven is. And here he's telling them, in the past, when they have been his emissaries in missions of proclaiming the good news throughout Galilee, they did not need to take anything with them, for people were hospitable to them. Now the time is changing. 
No longer will there be hospitality. It is the time to carry a sword. As Jesus very clearly says when he says it is enough, he has no intention of the disciples going out and knocking people's heads off if they're inhospitable. It's a symbol that the times are changing and rough. That as Jesus will say on the way to the cross, if they do this when the wood is green, what will they do when it is dry? A way of saying if in a time like this they treat the Son of Man this way, what will it be like when even there is greater decay in society and morals and judgments and politics and the like? What will the persecution and the trouble be then? So the Lord from the safe context of a meal invites us to live for him in a dangerous world where we are subject to test and temptation and trial. And I have underneath the communion this morning that cloth from Yugoslavia to remind us once more that some even today are having a more literal fulfillment of this matter, of the need for understanding that from the place of communion is the place of difficulty. One just last thing as we prepare to receive communion. There's a timeliness to the Lord's work. And while he is dying on the cross, it is Passover. He took the Passover meal the evening before. Why is it that uh, he waits, or he doesn't? Why is it that he does not wait? And so arrange it that his suffering could have been before Passover, that in his resurrected form he could have celebrated this meal with them. After all, he did eat and drink with them after his resurrection. But it's striking, he wants the Passover meal to be before, be before the resurrection. Because I think, like the first observance of Passover in the book of Exodus, one eats before the saving event has happened. One eats before salvation has occurred. One eats before one has gone through the Red Sea. He eats in faith. The first century disciples would live to see in very few short days after this meal, the Lord had risen from the dead and there would be that completed aspect of Passover they would have which no other generations of Christian believers has, has had in the sense that we, with our own eyes, have not seen Christ as raised from the dead. So we meet in a kind of suspense that those first century disciples met in. We meet not yet having seen him face to face, nor having touched his hands and his feet. So we simply, when we gather together, eat in faith. We're called upon to eat in faith and to believe that as we eat, and commemorate that act of salvation Christ has wrought for us, we anticipate that greater day when he returns for us. The bread and the cup are for whosoever will. You may come today and worship and rejoice in the Lord as you take these expressions of his love for you and for me.